on basic biology for engineers and big data analysis course. Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, essentially now in my uh, th this lecture about uh, some of the DNA tools, especially a polymerase chain reaction, uh, DNA sequencing and microarrays. So some of these are uh, more recent uh, technology which are emerging. Uh, PCR of course is quite old and has been uh, quite heavily used in the clinics, uh, but uh, sequencing, especially more of the recent versions of sequencing and microarrays are, are quite uh, still uh, buzzwords which are being used uh, for a variety of applications in the healthcare sector. So uh, in the outline, we will talk about uh, some uh, core concept of gene cloning, which is uh, quite important as you uh, want to know a little bit about molecular biology field. Uh, polymerase chain reactions, uh, the PCR, uh, the Sanger sequencing method and the next generation sequencing method. And then we will talk about gene expression analysis using microarrays, the kind of data which Submis was talking to you about how to generate that data and analyze that data. So let me come to this concept of gene cloning. Um, idea here is the way you do the photocopying and you take, uh, you know, edited notes and you can make the you know, hundreds and thousands of copies of that particular sheet uh, using the Xerox machines, right? Uh, similarly, can we take the gene of interest? Now we let's go back to my previous lecture of uh, the units or factors identified by uh, Mendel uh, and then later on it term to be genes. Now those gene sequences, can we take those and can we amplify that? And if we can amplify that, then that is what is known as gene cloning. So for doing that, uh, there are uh, essentially three major steps, especially if you are looking at a specific gene sequence and you want to amplify that. So people do these experiments, uh, which comes under the field of recombinant DNA technology, known, known as RDNA technology. Now here the uh, first part is you have identified a gene of interest. So let's say, uh, gene X, which is of your interest, which is uh, important for when we were talking about uh, X-linked gene inheritance, we were looking at specific genes uh, which are going to impart the properties for uh, color blindness or hemophilia, those kind of uh, issues, right? So now let's say you want to learn more about those genes or we talked about another case study on progeria syndrome and you want to study laminin A gene, for example, and you want to only amplify that gene of interest and you want to detect that uh, in different tests. So uh, what we're doing, you are uh, first trying to uh, you know, take the sequence of that gene of interest, uh, which is the, the DNA piece. And then you are taking, uh, you want to do this exercise in the bacteria uh, because you want to grow this DNA and you want to make more copies of the DNA eventually. So in bacteria, bacteria, as, as we uh, go back to our, my uh, fundamental lecture previous, when I talked to you about prokaryote and eukaryote, so prokaryotes or the bacteria, they have this uh, bacterial chromosome and plasmid, which is floating in the cell. They don't have the clear nuclear membrane. So now uh, this plasmid, which is extra chromosomal uh, material, uh, that genetic engineering scientists they have used as a way to uh, propagate more of the genetic material. So these uh, are now more genetically engineered plasmids, uh, which can be used as a vehicle. So like, you know, you want to go from uh, X to Y position using a car and likewise you want to move a gene from X to Y position. So you are using these as a vector uh, or a carrier. So now this particular plasmid from bacteria is taken out and you want to insert your gene of interest from the human gene of interest or plant gene of interest or uh, any other foreign gene of interest in this bacterial uh, plasmid. So now for doing that, you want to cut that uh, plasmid, cut that open. And then you want to insert this and then you want to uh, ligate like, you know, using glue stick, that kind of concept, right? Which is known as DNA ligation. Once this part has happened, now this uh, thing which is made now that is known as recombinant DNA or uh, which contains a foreign gene of interest. So now why you are doing in bacteria? Because bacteria grows very fast and you can manipulate the bacterial uh, plasmid uh, very easily. And now bacteria cannot recognize because it is coming from bacterial plasmid. So it cannot recognize that, you know, it is something coming from outside. So in a process known as transformation, you can move this plasmid in the bacteria again. And now your gene of interest in the background of bacterial plasmid is growing now. So as you grow bacteria from one culture, one tube to other tube, and it is growing in 20 minute cycle, it will keep making multiple copies of your gene of interest. So now you started a small amount of DNA. Now you will generate 
uh, tons of DNA from that particular uh, uh, clone. So this kind of concept is used for variety of research, uh, especially think about when you are, uh, if somebody is diabetic and or somebody is having heart problem and you are going to look for the you know, proteins like insulin every day for the diabetes, every day you need pure protein which should be high quality. And how these proteins are produced, you know, we don't uh, think many times that, you know, you go to a shop and buy that and of course, you know, high cost and then you want to use that. So these things come from the process known as protein expression in the heterologous systems like, you know, the bacteria and uh, uh, yeast. Some of these uh, organisms are used to grow these genes of interest to then make the more proteins of uh, our uh, requirements and then harvest those and use those for the therapeutic purpose or use those for the transgenic plants, which means the plants which is having the foreign genes. You might have heard terms like the Bt gene or other kind of transgenic crops. Idea is same that you know you are incorporating a gene of interest which is having superior quality and that you want to propagate that. Like for example, bacteria contains a Bt gene which is going to impart resistance against the insect and the pest. So you don't have to do the spray of the insecticide or the pesticide, but the plant itself contains a gene, Bt gene, which can repel the insect uh, from the plant. So that is a transgenic plant, and we have a lot of example of Bt cotton, Bt corn, many kind of those crops, which has also a lot of uh, issue, which you might have heard from Monsanto and other regulatory issues. But just giving you the flavor that gene cloning concept is very fundamental, very basic, but is used for both even the you know uh, biotechnology in the in the plant sector and also therapeutics in the human uh, uh, healthcare sector. So again, like, you know, if your goal was to uh, look at the gene of interest for the progeria syndrome, which we talked in the previous lecture, and you're looking at this lemon A gene, so you want to amplify this gene. So you want to first, you know, know uh, how this gene works and how, you know, you want to this protein works. So you want to, uh, uh, you know, know the sequence of this gene. You want to uh, make multiple copies of this gene, and then you want to, test out on the agarose gel to look at the specific size of this particular uh, you know, uh, amplification which you want to acquire from it. So to test out that you know what you are looking at a gene which is of a given size, is that correct size or not, then you use a technique known as agarose gel electrophoresis. So here you are looking at the phenomenon of electrophoresis. And if you remember, you know, we talked about uh, how DNA backbone is made of the phosphate negatively charged. So now negatively charged DNA is going to move in the uh, electric field with on the positive electrode side. So now in this way you can separate the DNA in the electrophoretic uh, field process known as agarose gel electrophoresis. You are putting the DNA in the agarose beads, separating those on those sieves, and then using electric field you are separating the negatively charged DNA. To visualize the DNA then you are adding uh, either you know you are using the UV light to visualize the DNA or you can use certain uh, dyes which can fluoresce and give the pattern of the DNA. So this is how you can see how DNA is looking. Uh, so this, this DNA could be uh, the DNA which you wanted to amplify from the cloning experiment. And now you want to make sure the size of the that uh, band of the DNA is the right size or not. So for doing that, you know, you do this experiment, which is known as agarose electrophoresis. Let me show you this video to give you some idea for this process. Electrophoresis is the most commonly used method in the field of biochemistry and the molecular biology for the separation of DNA. This technique also supports the separation and analysis of proteins and RNA. Electrophoresis is a technique used to separate and sometimes purify macromolecules that differ in size, charge or conformation. Agarose is a polysaccharide from the red algae obtained from agar that is used for a variety of life science applications, especially in gel electrophoresis. Agarose forms an inert matrix utilized in separation techniques. Many structures easily affects to agarose, including various types of proteins. The equipment and supplies necessary for conducting agarose gel electrophoresis are relatively simple. An electrophoresis chamber and power supply. Gel casting trays, which are available in a variety of sizes and composed of UV transparent plastic. Sample combs, around which molten agarose is poured to form sample wells in the gel. Electrophoresis buffer, which is usually a tris acetate EDTA or tris borate EDTA. Loading buffer, which contains something dense, example glycerol, to allow the sample to fall into the sample wells and one or two tracking dyes, which migrate in the gel and allow visual monitoring 
or to indicate how far the electrophoresis has proceeded. Ethidium bromide, a fluorescent dye used for staining nucleic acids and it helps to visualize the DNA molecule. The property of this chemical is that it binds to the DNA bases strongly and fluoresces orange. The separation of the molecules is achieved by the movement of a negatively charged nucleic acid molecules through an agarose matrix in a uniform electric field. The movement depends on the length and conformation of the molecule. Transilluminator, an ultraviolet light box which is used to visualize ethidium bromide stained DNA in gels. The main benefit of agarose gel electrophoresis is that it can be a preparative technique as the DNA can also be recovered without any harm to it at the end of the process. Agarose gel does not denature the DNA samples and stay in their native form. Gel electrophoresis can be used in the field of forensics. The process of DNA fingerprinting can be performed using the agarose gel DNA electrophoresis. All right, so uh, this gives you some idea how to visualize the DNA. Uh, but to make this process of you know uh, doing the DNA amplification quite simple, uh, there's a technique known as polymerase chain reaction. So gene cloning is more used when you want to actually uh, not only make the uh, large amount of DNA, but also you want to express the genes of your interest and you want to make proteins from those. Uh, but if the goal was only to amplify uh, certain fragments of DNA and you want to uh, look for forensic kind of test or uh, generate sufficient amount of DNA, you can use this technique known as polymerase chain reaction. So this was uh, developed uh, or invented by uh, scientist Carrie Mullis in 1984. Here idea is that, you know, uh, we talked about how the DNA double standard sequence looks like. Can you uh, amplify uh, that DNA sequence uh, to multiple copies? For doing that, there were three steps involved. One is strand separation of the double helix DNA. Second is the specific part where a primer is going to bind to that. And third, the DNA synthesis should happen. So uh, just to visualize this, so now we have this double standard DNA in opposite uh, pair directions, five prime to three prime and three prime to five prime. After denaturation, so your first, uh, this instrument, which is known as thermal cycler, uh, it just does the, like a thermostats, it does provide different, uh, you know, heating capacity. So, uh, you know, your first heating to denature the uh, DNA double standard to these single uh, strands now, and the strand separation will happen as a part of denaturation. And then you are adding a short stretch of uh, the oligonucleotides as a primer. So I hope you remember the nucleotide which we talked yesterday, nucleotide, uh, how, how uh, nucleoside and nucleotides are different. When you have the base and you have sugar and you have the phosphate residue, so now if you know a sequence of a gene which you want to amplify, for example, the lamin A gene which we are talking for uh, prosaria, if you want to amplify that gene of interest now, so you can just, uh, you know, chemically synthesize uh, these primers, which is having the short uh, ATGC, those sequence for that particular gene of interest. And now you are amplifying from both the sites here, and then you are providing sufficient material for DNA to make multiple copies of that so that the extension can happen and new nucleotide is being formed. It is now making the double standard DNA. So this is the more crude way that how a PCR cycle works. So in, in one way now, you know, from the after one cycle, from the one molecule, you got two molecules now. So you have doubled the copy of that, right? So likewise, in the three step process, if you do this particular uh, cycle multiple times, you are going to generate 2 to the power n copies, right? So think about if you are doing 2 to the power 30, 2 to the power 35. After every cycle, the uh, you know it is going to really generate large number of uh, molecules of DNA. So most of the time, after 32 to 35 cycle or 38 cycle, you generate sufficient amount uh, number of molecules which can be used for uh, your sufficient experiment for uh, uh, whatever DNA you need for doing those experiments. So let me show you this process of uh, polymerase chain reaction in this video. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. 
the primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the primed sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. All right, I, I hope you got a visual sense of how we are, uh, uh, you know, able Polymer to do the, this process of polymerase chain reaction, which is you might have uh, you know, uh, encountered and, and read many times that you know, on the forensic site, uh, uh, you know, the police got these kind of samples of the blood clots or looking at the hair and then sent to forensic lab. And then they uh, did this kind of, uh, you know, PCR amplification of DNA. Uh, to uh, try to then match that, you know, which uh, might be the culprit. So these kind of thing, DNA fingerprinting has been uh, in use from long time. Uh, but more and more now sequencing is coming to the picture when you also want to now know what is the sequence of that uh, DNA and uh, uh, which are the, uh, uh, you know, the, the genes which is in the right sequence or which genes might have changed because of a given disease, there might be mutation over there. And that's a different type of sequencing technology that are coming forward. But original concept of this, uh, of course, comes from the Sanger sequencing, but uh, it really got good uh, momentum, the entire sequencing effort with the Human Genome Project, which started in 1990s or so, and then reached to almost 2002 to complete the first draft of the human genome. And uh, these I'm sure everybody is aware of that uh, we got an idea that uh, human is made of around 25,000 genes at that time, although now we know that that number is around 20,000. Uh, along with human genome, there were multiple other sequencing projects from bacteria to yeast, Drosophila, Arabidopsis, mouse, many sequences actually uh, were getting accomplished. And idea was, you know, can we look at those nucleotide sequences? Now you know the DNA structure, you know the nucleotide sequence that I'm talking about. So can we try to map those ATGC uh, uh, in, in which particular order they are all uh, present in that given sequence? How best to uh, look for that kind of sequencing? So there are a lot of advancement happening in this entire field of sequencing technology, and there are more and more newer approaches that are coming forward. But uh, let me just take you to the classical approach of doing that, which was known as shotgun sequencing. So uh, again, you know, the basic concept of chromosome and all may not be so scary now for you because we have talked about them. So now if you have this, uh, you know, the DNA fragment coming from a given chromosome, you have first, you know, uh, cut those pieces, clone into a given plasmid, and then now you are sequencing each of these fragments. You want to know what is the composition of these uh, nucleotides in that particular stretch. And then you are trying to align those multiple overlapping fragments to put together the sequence. So this was known as a shotgun sequencing approach. And uh, Sanger is you know, the, the one, the scientist Fred, Frederick Sanger, who gets all the credit to initiate uh, the sequencing efforts. And he got the Nobel Prize in 1980 for developing the sequencing method. Uh, which is based on a uh, slightly you know, uh, difficult name, which is di-deoxynucleotides, uh, which was used for uh, coloring uh, using different type of fluorescent color tags. So we are talking about ATGC, those bases, and those were uh, having the fluorescent versions of those four, which can be used to sequence the, uh, the DNA, which is we want to sequence. Just to give you a slightly more detail about it, of course, don't feel uh, worry about the lot of uh, complex terminologies here. But if this is a sequence that you want to identify uh, the DNA uh, template, so you are first going to do denaturation of that DNA, which uh, by now you know it is double standard. So you are going to do the denaturation to make them single standard. Then you are taking a specific stretch of the uh, primers, which is the short nucleotide sequence, which is going to be designed for a base pair uh, with the known three prime end and the five prime end. And then you are having the DNA polymerase enzyme, which is going to initiate, uh, help this particular reaction to happen. You are also going to have these deoxyribonucleotides like A, C, T, G, which we talked, you know, they're uh, uh, 
DATP versions or D oxyribonucleotides, which is DDATP, DDCTP, DDTTP, and DDGTP. Now these D oxyribonucleotides, these are the fluorescent labels. So uh, this version is contains some fluorescent tag for A, C, T, and G. So this is where uh, now the main trick was, and the difference between these two are uh, that this one contains hydroxyl OH group. Uh, in the sugar and then the deoxyribonucleotide, uh, they do not contain uh, hydroxyl groups. So now, once you have done initial first reaction, uh, this is the stepwise uh, process shown here. There are three steps involved. You just have enlarged the first one. Then after you have done that, then now you are looking at uh, with the primer which you have already added. You are looking at the elongation of this particular uh, strand length, and wherever the DDC uh, or DDG, DDA, uh, DDT, they will come. It is going to stop that reaction to happen, and you will see that fluorescence color change because of that uh, binding with that particular dideoxy uh, nucleotide. So then, once these are getting elongated and these are labeled strands are available, now you are going to pass them from the uh, fluorescent detector, which is going to now look at and read that uh, the sequence of these nucleotides like GACT, GAAGC in this case, which is based on the fluorescent patterns. So. Uh, it just kind of in a nutshell gives you idea that you know how you took a uh, double standard DNA. Uh, you did the uh, denaturation of that, added uh, DNTPs, DDNTPs, and the uh, uh, you know along with the primers and the uh, DNA polymerase, initiated those reactions, and then after doing the uh, cycle elongation, then you are trying to read those in this type of fluorescent readers, which is going to generate these kind of patterns. This was just one of the approach how to sequence the DNA. Of course, this was much more uh, time consuming and, and very tedious process. And over the years, now scientists have also tried to come up with a newer approaches of sequencing DNA. And that is uh, one method known as sequencing by synthesis method, which is which can actually do even 700 to 900 million nucleotides sequencing just in 10 hours. This one picture shows that you know the, some, there are many labs now which are equipped with a very uh, large number of fast uh, next generation sequencers. So uh, in these kind of uh, high throughput uh, next generation sequencing, uh, the basic concept remains same. You want to identify what is that ATGC sequence uh, present in that given unique uh, in a given gene or given entire DNA segment, right? So you want to take the DNA fragment, amplify them to yield an enormous uh, number of identical fragments so that you are sufficient for the sequencing. Then the specific strand of each fragment you are trying to immobilize and then a complementary strand is getting synthesized, something I, I talked in the previous concept of microarray, uh, but one nucleotide at a time here. And then you are going to use some way of uh, physical principles to try to monitor that change and look at how that particular uh, reaction finishes up with A, T, G, or C. And then you want to have some readout which you can uh, take for uh, deciphering these sequences. So this particular method is known as sequencing by synthesis. But I'll show you uh, there are many possibilities now where people are trying to read uh, the changes in these ATGC based pairs, you know, wherever they are finishing for the sequencing, how they can read either using a scanning tunneling electron microscopes, uh, FRET method like fluorescence resonance energy transfers, single molecule detection, or even protein nanopores. So there are many methods available, which is now very fast way they are trying to sequence and know what is the nucleotide sequences you have in the given DNA sample. So uh, let me show you one of these process, which is very uh, promising and also very uh, fast and very simple. And this is one of the handheld devices which comes as a nanopore sequencer. Of course, there are many good platform from the Illumina sequencer as well as from the uh, uh, thermo uh, sequencers. But this method is, is quite uh, interesting given that uh, you can take handheld small uh, sequencer and you use that for sequencing the uh, DNA. At the heart of strand sequencing is a protein nanopore. This model shows a typical nanopore made from protein. You can see that at the core of the protein is a hollow tube that is only a few nanometers in diameter. Oxford Nanopore designs and manufactures bespoke nanopore structures for a range of applications. In nature, nanopores form holes in membranes. In Oxford Nanopore's system, the nanopore is inserted into a membrane created by a synthetic polymer. This membrane has very high electronic resistance. Here you can see a nanopore piercing a single hole 
in a membrane made from synthetic polymer. A potential is applied across the membrane, resulting in a current flowing only through the aperture of the nanopore. Single molecules that enter the nanopore cause characteristic disruptions in the current. By measuring that disruption, the molecule can be identified. In strand sequencing, an intact DNA polymer is sequenced as it passes through the nanopore. Here you see a DNA enzyme complex approaching the nanopore shown in blue. The enzyme shown in green is designed to ratchet the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The enzyme binds to the end of a double strand of DNA and unzips the double strand to form a long single strand which it feeds through the nanopore. As the DNA strand moves through the nanopore one base at a time, a characteristic disruption in current is created by the presence of particular combinations of bases in a particular part of the nanopore. Because these disruptions in current are so specific to the different combinations, this information can be used to determine the order of bases on that DNA strand. There is no deterioration of accuracy as the long DNA strand is sequenced. By preparing the DNA so it has a hairpin structure at its end, the system can read both strands, that is the sense and antisense strands of the DNA. This gives advantages in data analysis. In order to create a high throughput system, a number of nanopore... So let me uh, uh, skip the entire detail, but I hope you got a flavor that, uh, you know, how by employing different, uh, you know, uh, elegant physical principles, you're trying to see the changes in these uh, base pairs and trying to get the entire stretch of these uh, DNA to be sequenced. Uh, of course, we can talk more about this as we go along, but uh, just to connect what we are talking more experiments on the gene expression and the microarrays. Uh, I think, you know, the goal, as I uh, briefly mentioned, uh, even my uh, initial lecture, that uh, the, these genes are present in, uh, you know, different cell types, and but they're not going to waste their energy to express everywhere. So they are, for example, uh, this example I had shown from the uh, uh, NIH, uh, this site, where in the nerve cell, muscle cell, intestinal cell, you have all of these genes present, but the gene is going to be, specific gene is only going to get turned on in the nerve cell, and a specific gene is going to get turned on in the muscle cell. Every gene is not going to get turned on in, in all of these cells because they don't want to waste energy of uh, synthesizing those uh, RNA and protein molecule everywhere. So that's where there, you will see that, you know, certain uh, cell type and certain uh, uh, organelles, certain organs, they're going to express very unique type of uh, genes expression and the proteins will be formed. So now people start uh, thinking about how to compare these type of expression uh, profile and use that because we already have some idea for the PCR polymerase chain reaction, which can actually amplify the DNA of interest easily. So if we can take mRNA or the messenger RNA, uh, I also talked to you about you know type of RNA is present. So if you take uh, mRNA, you can make complementary DNA from that in a process known as cDNA synthesis. So that complementary DNA now you can again amplify further using RT-PCR technique. So this is how, uh, if you want to know the specific amount of mRNA, you can amplify them using uh, real-time PCR or reverse trans transcription PCR, and you can use this method for looking at the gene expression. So like in the cell, you are looking at the, from the genes, what is the RNA, which is the more functional form, of the uh, uh, molecule present, uh, how that is going to show expression. So you are making cDNA from that, synthesizing that, and then after that, you're going to do further amplification using uh, polymerase chain reaction. Then you can run on the gel and look for uh, those profile. Uh, currently, I'm sure everybody, even from engineering background or biology background, have heard about uh, real-time PCR testing for COVID, right? So uh, same thing, you know, you are looking at viral RNA over there, you know, so what I just showed you, uh, in that case, it will become viral RNA. You are looking at in the human nasopharyngeal swab sample, uh, what is that, uh, you know, RNA pre uh, present from the virus? You want to amplify that. So these technicians from different path labs, they're amplifying those, making that, you know, the cDNA form and then going to use the real-time PCR to amplify this particular viral RNA to detect that what is the virus present uh, SARS-CoV-2 or not. And that is being done with the real-time PCR instruments. What the values you see that is uh, in the cycle number or the threshold of cycle CT values, uh, which shows that if you are able to detect 
the virus in very few cycle, it means there is quite a high load of viruses present. If you take many cycle to amplify, now you know the PCR how it works. 2 to the power n, every you know cycle is going to get further amplified the molecules. So if you are going to have a large number of uh, uh, cycle to amplify that uh, uh, RNA from the virus, it means the load is very low for the virus, right? So uh, this is how uh, this kind of uh, you know the concept which we are talking right now. Uh, you can think about how they are actually uh, even being currently used, even in the practical sense what we are talking. So uh, yeah, so real time PCR is is important in that way to uh, uh, not only locate. In this case, we are using for detection of the uh, viral RNA, but uh, many times we are looking at how a gene is expressed from control condition to the test condition, uh, healthy individual versus cancer patient, how the genes are expressing, and we can use these techniques. Uh, microarray, I have been talking in, the, in this course, even Dr. Rodrigo has talked about this course. Uh, I have worked in this area for a long time, and uh, I used to teach some courses in Cold Spring Harbor in New York, as I mentioned earlier as well. So uh, I'm just showing you some lab uh, pics over there, so you can think about such a nice view here. And when we used to go to teach these courses over there, it was like, you know, very isolated uh, houses provided. When you are simulating and creating a lab and every instrument is being provided to do those experiments. So if you make any mistake, it's very difficult for you to, you know, recover that. And selected participants from all over the world, they used to come over there. And But these experiments are very longish and they take many steps and a lot of meticulous uh, effort of amplifying these uh, properly and looking at the signals. If you make any mistake, you know, then uh, your entire effort can be lost. So I was teaching this course and some students or participants that time, they, they captured this video. Uh, online recording was not so much at that time, 2008-9 I'm talking. So I'm just showing this clip. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah. And someone raised their so many timers are used to monitor different experiments ongoing as you can see you know a lot of meticulous efforts has to be done for doing these experiments <laughs> And yeah, as we uh, were doing, of course, you know, you can see a lot of teamwork is required, a lot of people are working together to do these things. And some last steps are so crucial that if you make any mistake uh, at last minute, you can't detect the right signal and, uh, you know, intensity could be very misleading. So a lot of careful efforts required. You need to really provide right, right training and people have to pay attention to those protocols. Yeah. So anyway, so something like that, you know, when uh, now uh, we are uh, doing research here at IIT Bombay, we have collaborated with Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai and looking at some of the cancer problems. So one of the arrays platform, which Professor Subnis also mentioned, uh, we used human proteome arrays chip, which is contains all type of uh, human proteins. Uh, this is in collaboration with Johns Hopkins in, in US. Uh, so now we have all this access to these uh, uh, Huprot arrays. And this is the step which we are performing, which I showed you in that lab views. So you take these arrays where all these features are printed, which high dimensional data, which Professor Subnis mentioned to you, is coming from here. Uh, we are adding the patient serum sample. Uh, in this case, these are the patients which are having cancer, uh, different grades of glioma or the brain tumor, which we are talking of grade two, grade three, grade four. So now the patient's uh, serum sample contains potential, like, you know, possibility of having some antibodies uh, against the uh, uh, this particular, you know, mutation which might be there. Uh, and then aim is can we detect those? So these uh, tumor specific antigen which we are trying to detect here, uh, we are then trying to incubate with another antibody which is having the fluorescence tags, and then the Cy3, Cy5 uh, type of uh, uh, molecules. And then we are going to scan those and look at the uh, image in the analysis. This is how the, the image looks like of those 50,000 or so, 48 or some thousand features. Uh, and then we look at variety of uh, quality control checks, look at how best to normalize the entire data. Uh, and then after doing a lot of work with the subness and the team, then finally we, we see like which of the protein which makes any sense uh, clinically that you know how a patient when they come from the uh, you know, 
in the healthy con condition, uh, healthy individual or in the low grade disease to high grade disease, how these proteins are you know, showing higher expression. So like this is sorting next in one, one of the protein which showed uh, it's a linear increase as the disease is progressing from low grade to high grade or another protein like EYA1, which is showing the down uh, regulation of that. Uh, immunoglobulin in uh, IgHg1 showed very high uh, regulation from as we go along the disease, right? So this, uh, this is a kind of thing you, at the end you want to see the output of your data, but it goes through a lot of rigorous process of different steps involved in uh, processing these arrays and uh, looking at hundreds of these patient samples. So we are actually generating, uh, you know, maybe 200 patient data set and every data contains almost, uh, you know, those 19,000 features in duplicate. So, you know, huge data to really analyze. And finally, on the biological side and the clinical side, you want to know which of the crucial genes are getting changed, which of the crucial proteins are getting modified, how they are changing some of the pathways in the body, and can we use some of these pathways as a way for the further treatment of these patients? So these are the, the way how the, this kind of research progresses. This is a lab which is uh, we have set up at IIT Bombay here. Uh, let me uh, show you one of the lab views and the uh, uh, some process of doing so plan is that we want to show you some experiment being done in the lab uh, using protein array platform. And one chip which we are going to use is actually who brought chip or human proteome array chip which we uh, do in collaboration with Johns Hopkins and CDI lab, uh, where the, uh, uh, the the slide itself contains almost uh, you know uh, 20,000 human proteins, and in fact 19,000 probably the, the it's printed in duplicate 38,000 features, along with a lot of control spots which are there, and how we can use this particular platform for our antibody screening. So that will be the first thing which uh, you know uh, the Shalini will take over with me shortly. Uh, then uh, another TA, Nikita, she is going to talk about how to scan the chips because after you have done the uh, screening, how to uh, scan the slides and look at briefly their grid and the data analysis matrix. Uh, and then we want to talk to you about two applications, which are you know variety of you know diseases which we want to talk. How protein microarray based platforms could be used for uh, studying humoral responses in case of malaria and how it could be utilized for the autoantibody uh, based biomarker studies uh, for various type of cancer uh, based screening program. So uh, the idea is to give you some feel of doing the protein microarray based experiment. Of course, actual experiment takes longer time. So we are going to reduce the incubation timing. Uh, but after doing this experiment, how to handle the slide, how to scan the slide, you know, what goes into looking at the various settings for the scanning and placing the grid, which you're going to use the molecular devices scanner, uh, and then uh, once you are happy that you know you are exporting the information for the data analysis part, and then based on those data, then what kind of application we can do? Uh, and we will take two type of application: one for the protein microarrays, and second will be for the uh, autoantibody screening in the cancer. So I hope you know this kind of gives you uh, a good feel of doing protein microarray based uh, overall workflow. Uh, and of course, you know we will be happy to take more queries from you over the time uh, as we go along in the through today's demo session. I'll hand over now to Shalini, who is uh, pretty ready now for talking to you about how to do autoantibody screening uh, using protein arrays uh, platform. All right, Shalini. Hi, all. So I'll be explaining you about microarray. And uh, for this, first of all, I would like to explain how it is done so that uh, we can have a broad view uh, like we should know that how we are doing and what are the basic principles behind the experiment. Then we can start doing the live session demo so that you'll be able to know how the experiment is exactly done and what are the uh, steps which you need to follow. So now we'll go on the slide and I'll show you that you can see that uh, here is the serum sample. We take the serum sample for taking the anti auto antibodies and for uh, taking whether a disease, a particular disease is having any autoantibody generation or not. So, we, this is the procedure how we print the slides using a liquid handler and printing machines which are very accurate in spotting all the spots which are of equal width because each uh, width of the each uh, spot corresponds to a particular intensity which can, uh, which can uh, tamper with your results. So it has to be of a particular size. So after printing the proteins on the slide, 
then we incubate the printed slide with serum which is having auto antibodies and then after incubation of the auto antibodies with the printed proteins then we incubate and after that we screen those with secondary antibodies which are labeled so we split the protocol into two parts because in this case you are able to see this is only for the testing purpose like this is for screening the auto antibodies but how can you be sure that your uh, printed proteins are working properly or not or whether they are printed or not so for that we also have qc check that is quality check quality control check uh, steps so we have split in we have split the protocol into two parts first part is where we are taking the serum and incubating it with the uh, protein printed proteins but before that we need to block the slide so that uh, there is no non specific binding of the serum on the slide so that is done by blocking agents uh, it can contain skim milk or bsa which can cover the whole unwanted places where the protein is already not there so after that we place uh, we incubate uh, serum with the slide and then we leave it for some time and to remove the non specific binding of the uh, serum auto antibodies then we wash it using uh, using a particular optimized buffer which one need to optimize according to their own experiments then after that we need to have secondary auto uh, secondary antibodies which are specific to the auto antibodies that is anti human igg as first one is uh, human antibodies that means Uh, the secondary antibody should be against human igg only so these secondary antibodies are always labeled so that we can detect whether these antibodies or auto antibodies are there or not for a particular disease condition then after incubation we need to wash these non specifically bind secondary antibodies also using the same washing buffer and then we can use the slides which are now coated with primary as well as secondary antibodies by using microarray scanners and in this case we are having for second uh, anti human igg we are we have labeled it with sci fi which is uh, which shows absorbance and uh, fluorescence at 635 nanometer of uh, wavelength then comes the second step, second step of the protocol that is the qc check that is called quality control check in that we take anti gst because as sir has already explained you that all the proteins which are printed on this chip are having gst tags so that we can we can use this chips also for the qc chip so now now we'll be taking anti gst antibodies and then uh, we'll be incubating it similarly as the primary antibodies of uh, in the previous step after incubation we'll be washing again to remove the non specifically bind anti gst antibodies and then we'll incubate it using uh, secondary antibodies which are labeled with sci fi now and these antibodies will be against anti gst antibodies so it will be anti anti gst antibodies so after that after proceeding with all these steps then we'll be scanning these slides using the same microarray scanner now i will be showing you the live demo of how this experiment is done step wise so here you can see that this is the slide this is bar coded and this is having all the proteins which are printed on it you will not be able to see it because they are very minute and you can imagine that there are approximately 40000 of spots here including all control and protein so now we'll place in a box we have to place it such that the barcode is upside that means the barcode is on the same side of the printed protein so we need to keep it in this way so that the proteins are not harmed or not removed so after placing this need to add blocking buffer but while adding the blocking buffer you need to be very careful you have to add it from the edge so that it's not directly on the chip and after adding you need to let it immerse properly 
and then you will incubate it on the rocker for some time. But as, as this is just a demo session, I will not incubate it. I will remove the blocking reagent now, blocking buffer now. And then to remove the excess blocking buffer, we need to add a suitable buffer. Here we are using 1x TBSC for our experiments. So we I am using same here. So similarly, as the blocking buffer, you have to add this also. And now you have to again incubate it so that the washing is done properly. But the washing steps are to be repeated right so that the washing is proper. And if you still feel that there is some background remaining during the optimization, you can increase the timing of the washing or you can increase the number of steps for washing. Now, after this, after you have removed the excess of blocking buffer, then now you can add primary uh, antibody. That is, I have made digestion of primary antibody. And now I'll be adding primary antibody to the chip. It is again added similar way. Nothing is to be added directly on the slide because it can uh, alter the proteins which are printed on this. It will. So you have to just incubate it again so that the primary antibodies are able to capture the proteins which are there. And then we will discard this again. Now, after incubating it with primary antibody, again, there can be many antibodies which are present there, which are bound non-specifically and loosely. So now to remove those, again, we have to go for the washing step. Again, we have to wash it. After washing, you have to discard the wash buffer. And now comes this step also. Again, you have to do it twice to thrice times as per the uh, protocol we have optimized. And then after that, you have to add secondary antibody so that the primary antibody can be coated, can be detected by secondary antibody, which are labeled. That's why we have uh, wrapped it with aluminum foil. Now, after incubating the secondary antibodies, we can just discard this also. And we need to give final washing, which we can just dispense it in water. It should be uh, clean water. Now we are taking this. In this beaker, I have already taken some water. Just rinse, rinse it, rice or and that should be enough. So now we need to keep it for some time so that the slide gets dried and you don't have to, uh, you can dry it air, right? you can uh, dry the slides by air drying or you can centrifuge it at lower uh, RPM so that uh, the slides are dry because you cannot uh, scan it without drying the slides. So it will take some time. That's why we have already taken some slides which are dry and processed. So this is another slide which we are going to show you how to scan. So this is the microarray scanner. So you need to open this here and you can lift it. But here as while processing, we were keeping that barcoding was upside. But now here, by placing this, we need to read the proteins that for that we need to place it upside down. So after placing it, you have to close it. And then now you can use the software, different softwares to analyze it. But to uh, explain you more about this, another TA, that is Nikita, will come and explain you about it. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Nikita, and I will be talking about the standard slides. So, uh, to start with this, It is going 
So uh, once the slide is kept in the standard, we can once the slide is kept in the standard, we can uh, uh, we use gene here we are using GenePix Pro GenePix 4000B a standard which is a dual channel standard. So we can scan two wavelengths. Uh, so we can scan two wavelengths at one time. Uh, here we have uh, run the, uh, we have incubated the slide with uh, anti-GST antibody, which is for the uh, quality control of the slide, and it has a standard. Uh, uh, it scans at uh, green channel, which is at 532, and uh, the auto antibodies are detected at uh, wavelength of 635, which is uh, the secondary antibodies are labeled with Elixir uh, triple five antibody. So uh, here we will be uh, showing how to scan the slides. Uh, in the meantime, we can look at these uh, slides for the scanning. Yeah. So here you can see uh, there are uh, tabs for laser setting where you can set the uh, two multiple wavelengths. So here we can set 635, which is for the autoantibody screening. Uh, here we use uh, anti-human antibody, and uh, the another is 630, uh, 532 for the green channel, where which is used for the uh, which is Sci-5 Sci-3 label, and which is used for uh, the quality control of the slide. Uh, also, we can set the PMT gain of the slide to scan the slide. Uh, scan the slides. So depending upon the PMT gain, the uh, saturation of the spots will be seen. So if you increase the PMT gain at a very high level, the most of the spots will be saturated. But if you reduce the PMT, more, more, you will not be able to see a lot of the spot. So here we need to make a, a perfect balance between not that all the spots should be uh, highlighted or saturated and not all the spots should be uh, and none of the spots should be visible. So there, so there is an option called as auto PMT where uh, you can select how many percent of uh, sam of the spots you want to be uh, that you want to be saturated and then you can uh, according to that the system scans the slide at three different pmts and the best pm at both the wavelengths and the best pmt at which you get uh, the perfect uh, desi desired results those pmt you can select for uh, scanning the slides make sure that all the slides for an experiment is scanned at a singular at a single PMP, because otherwise it might lead to erroneous results. So here you can see the effect of PMT gain on the scanning of slide. So when the PMT gain was 300, you can, you can barely see any of these spots here. But then when we increase the PMT gain to 400, much of the spots were visible. When we increase it to 500, you can see that nothing is visible. Uh, this is how the so uh, we, we have to make a perfect balance and make sure that we are using a PMT gain where uh, a lot of spots can are visible, but not much of them are getting saturated. This is how a scan slide look, and this is a zoomed in image of uh, a blob which is scanned. So once we scan the slide, we need to know uh, where the, what are these proteins because these are just the just spots of proteins dupli uh, present uh, printed in duplicates. So to know which is the uh, where which protein lies. Every uh, company vendor provides you with the with a GPR file, and this GPR file uh, contains the location of the of the protein spots on the chip. So, uh, sorry, GAL file. So you can just open uh, the array list, and here from there you can open a GAL file. So GAL when you open a GAL file, something like this, these arrays will come onto this uh, onto the image. You have to fit these GAL file. As for the uh, positive controls, negative positive control spots on the chip, and then you can uh, lay the grid accordingly, and you have to resize the structure. We will now see. We will not now see. Uh, the, we will not do a hands-on on the scanning of the slides. This is the software interface, which is known as GenePix Pro for scanning the slides. Here, there are tabs like here there are uh, tabs like uh, review scan, 
normal scan of the slides and then you can uh, select the uh, select the wavelengths at which you have to scan like 635 532 you can also set the scan power like the fd gain as discussed for scanning the slide i'll show you how it affects how this uh, pmp gain affects with the uh, affects the scanning of slide so let's start with the preview scan of the slide so here you can see the slide has started uh, and here you can see the pmp gain is at 525 So you can see these spots are being uh, scanned, but this is a preview scan, so it will not be shown properly. Uh, you can just increase it to maybe say 600, and we can see the increased intensity of the spots at this region. Let me do it at 700. So here you can see that increasing the PMT gain actually increases the saturation of the spots and the slide. If you reduce it to say 400, you can see how the slide, uh, how the intensity has been reduced for the spots. So we need to do a scan at a proper setting. Once the scan is done, once the preview scan is done, we go for a normal grid laying area. So I stop the scan, preview scan here. We now have to adjust the area for the slide so that uh, most of the spot, so that we capture all the spots. We scan all the spots in the slide. So here you can see you can resize the window. You can zoom it and check whether it has been aligned properly or not. So this is where the slide slide is starting from. So we can just uh, unlock the area and we can reduce it. and then we can using this we can scan this slide so i'll just uh, scanning takes a lot of time so i'll just go go on and show you how the data how to lay the grid on the slides so this is one scan slide here if you see these are the green channel data uh, which is for the quality control of the slide and then uh, if you zoom it you can see the spots here and then now we will start laying the grid so these are just the spots and there is no identity you can see that there is no identity of these spots here you uh, it's just gives you an x and y dimension of the spot so now what we'll do is we'll go to the folder and we will open the array list so this is how the grid looks like now we will select take all the block blocks and we will try to place it place the grid properly as per the blocks so you can zoom it and look into it if the grid is laid properly or not so this is the start point so here you can uh, lay the grid and then you can try to uh, resize the grid using different keys it will try to look out on the uh, on all the spots in and around the uh, so in and around the specified circle and then it will try to resize the circles based on uh, the spot present so here you can see that it has tried to refix uh, or realign the grid but then if you zoom into these uh, this area you can see that the uh, because of this artifact these spots were not taken properly so what you have to do is you have to go to the feature mode and you have to resize you have to resize Sorry, you have to resize these points. Like that, we align the grid, and we can see the now we can see the identity of the protein. If we select on the feature, we can see the identity of protein. It gives you a, a gene accession ID here. So that is how uh, you can determine the uh, name of the protein. Once you have aligned the slide, through once you have aligned all the uh, features on a slide. you go to this data tab to uh, get a, uh, to get the intensity values for each and every spot and which is further saved into in, in a format of dot gpr file uh, uh, show everything very easily to give you the entire feel of doing the experiment but 
at least some flavor to convey you that how these kind of complex biological experiments which we are talking can be performed in the lab. Uh, so, you know, I hope you know you are start putting together various pieces which we are trying to cover in the course, you know, how to uh, think about, you know, the gene sequences, the, uh, the DNA which we are talking, or the different proteins which we want to analyze, how to print those on the arrays, lot of printing technologies are involved, uh, again, uh, how to scan those images, you need more devices. And there's a professor, uh, uh, Siddhartha Dutta Gupta, he is developing, you know, those scanner and uh, image, uh, image systems. Uh, and then, you know, once we have done this experiment, you want to uh, export this big data out uh, and you want to analyze that data and you need a lot of statistical power to and different models, different methods to, uh, to make justice of the data to find out the most significant features out of that. So again, you need the collaboration from, uh, uh, you know, mathematics and statistics people like the subness and uh, all of those is going to lead towards a uh, lot of model prediction, which you want to then utilize from the AI and machine learning how to find out the best signatures as a potential biomarker. So there is a lot of, you know, interdisciplinary teams are involved in doing these experiments, but these technologies which we are talking, whether it's genomics or proteomics, they're really contributing significantly to understand biology or different clinical applications. And whether you name any type of field of life sciences, uh, primarily medical science, which we are focusing on, or even you think about evolution, paleontology, species interactions in the plants, conservation biology. In all of these fields, there is a lot of uh, applications now where these tools and technologies from genomics and proteomics are heavily being used. So if you know how to analyze this kind of data set, if you know how to interpret this information, I think the applications are immense. One could utilize them based on their interest to a variety of problems. So just finally to sum up, uh, I think what we are talking is the central dogma of life. We are looking at the things at much larger scale. We are looking at the omics scale. We are talking about all the genes of a given system at genome level, all the transcripts or the RNA at the transcriptome level, all the proteins at the proteome level, or even layers beyond that, which is looking at all the metabolites of the, in the body, or how these uh, metabolites are interacting with the environment at the phenotype level, phenome level. All of these are generating layer by layer information. And that's where this new field of system biology is coming very powerful, where you want to generate the models from the this kind of known data set and then apply though at that to the unknowns for prediction. And that's where a lot of again uh, com computer scientists who are coming forward to work in this area and generating those kinds of simulations and models. So this is a very evolving field, uh, definitely very interesting to uh, to really get involved. And I'm sure whatever expertise you have, uh, it will definitely uh, be utilized uh, to make that a strong team which is required for uh, solving many of these fundamental biological problems. So what I cover today is essentially some of the basic concepts from the core technologies of uh, molecular biology, especially the DNA cloning. How to visualize those uh, uh, amplified DNA from the PCR uh, on the acherosia electrophoresis. Gene cloning has many benefits, many potential. I try to describe you that at the therapeutic level as well as in the plants and agriculture level. And uh, we gave you some idea for doing the DNA microarrays and the protein microarray based experiments. I have already talked to you earlier that how this kind of gene expression analysis has really helped us to understand that uh, breast cancer is not one cancer type, it is multiple subtype. And likewise, now we know for other cancers as well that you know they have multiple subtypes. And if you give the treatment based on those uh, gene expression of a specific subtype, then that will be more effective. So these sequencing technologies are now becoming more and more routine technologies, and they're really uh, transforming the way we have seen the medical field, it is really getting transformed. We are not looking at generalized problems to every individual, but we are planning to have more specialized therapy, more personalized therapy to every individual uh, based on what their uh, uh, gene signatures are, what their protein signatures are, how the metabolites are getting changed in those individuals. I hope you are uh, really excited to, to learn some more things as a part of this particular activity. Some of these references which I have used from um, especially the Campbell book, some of the uh, uh, video contents I have acknowledged. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, thank you. All, uh, thanks to all of you for staying so late and uh, continuously being uh, uh, involved in this process of discussions. So I'll stop this presentation.